Okay, hello everybody. Welcome back to part two of this uh, lecture series on sampling. Uh, it's actually been a bit of a while since I uh, recorded part one because there's been many things going on uh, behind the scenes here at the Winters household. And also uh, I recorded this uh, particular portion of the sampling lecture two days ago, but uh, I didn't actually record it. I just talked through all the notes and then it turned out um, my computer didn't save anything. So hopefully that won't happen again. But if you're watching this, that means it hasn't. So I guess we can not worry about it. Uh, but anyway, what I want to talk about in this portion of the lecture is just um, some basic guidelines uh, that are important to keep in mind when you actually go through the process of sampling some data yourself. So when you go out into the world and collect data on some group of interest uh, or some linguistic phenomenon that you care about, um, you need to keep these guidelines in mind so that the sampling process itself kind of doesn't get in the way of you being able to draw meaningful conclusions from your data. Uh, okay, so with that in mind, I want to start out with this basic distinction, which I believe we've talked about before, but is worth talking about again. Uh, it's the distinction between a population and a sample. So a population means the entire group of individuals in which we are interested, in, but usually can't access directly. Um, so if you want to make some sort of statement about, you know, how human beings operate as, you know, an entire group or species of beings, uh, you normally cannot go around the entire world and, you know, talk to every single human being or study every single human being, right? You normally look at a subset of human beings uh, and see how they operate. And from that subset of people, you draw conclusions about all the human beings in the world. Uh, and hopefully you're jumping to a conclusion about everybody is justified, but you never know exactly for sure because you can't study everybody in the world. Um, you could also, this is, a, I, I guess I'll preface this by saying I got these slides from the Introduction to the Practice of Statistics textbook, um, which I mentioned to you before. They come from a while back, uh, and so uh, they're formatted in a slightly different way, and they use examples that um, wouldn't necessarily be the first things to come to the top of my mind. But one of the other examples they use is all crickets. If you're a biologist, I guess you might be interested in studying crickets. I don't know why. Uh, maybe, who knows? Uh, you want to know how they produce their noises or something, which is, I guess, how a linguist would approach biology. But anyways, um, again, you can't study all crickets. Uh, or if you want to look at all working age people in California, that's hard to do as well. There's a lot of people in California. Uh, and another example that comes to mind is uh, from sort of recent news is uh, just um, thinking about all the people, say, in a place like Alberta. Uh, so in Alberta, we've had this vaccination drive over the past few months to get everybody vaccinated against the um, coronavirus. But uh, of course, not everybody is uh, getting vaccinated. Um, that's a, an important part of the story. Uh, and it's worth it to know, though, how many people have gotten vaccinated so far, because that gives us some sense of how likely the um, virus is to keep spreading into an ap epidemic, right? So I think right now we're close to like 70 or 75 percent of people having at least the first shot of um, the vaccine. Uh, so that's uh, an important number to know with respect to whether or not we're getting close to herd immunity and whether um, things will keep spreading. But that specific number when we're talking about all the people in Alberta, how many have been vaccinated, uh, that's a parameter, uh, which is a number describing a characteristic of the population. Uh, and normally we talk about parameters like in terms of like, say, the mean height or something, the mean value or the standard deviation. We've seen those numbers before. Uh, but if they apply to every single you know, a description of every single member of a group, then they're a parameter uh, rather than something else, which is called a statistic. Um, yeah, so uh, that is the flip side of this distinction. So a sample is the part of the population we actually examine and for which we do have data. So again, to draw this, to hopefully make this clear, um, with like the vaccination numbers in Alberta, uh, since the government is keeping records of this and knows how many people live in the province, more or less, uh, that they're able to actually come up with a specific number, like telling us this parameter, like how many people have been vaccinated out of all the people in Alberta. Uh, but let's say you weren't the government and you wanted to sort of just make a guess about how many people have been vaccinated. You don't really need to do this, but if you you did, what you might do is say, just go out, you know, downtown Calgary and like ask the first 20 people you see on the street, well, have you been vaccinated against the coronavirus? And then from that, you can, you know, come up with a number, like how many people say yes, uh, and then maybe draw conclusions about sort of the entire population of Alberta from that data, right? 
but there's an important note here in the slide which says how well the sample uh, represents the population depends on the sample design, which is really what we're trying to focus on in this part of the lecture here. Um, so you can think for a second before we get into um, specific examples on um, following slides, but like if I were to just talk to people in downtown Calgary um, and ask them like, have you been vaccinated against the coronavirus? And then how appropriate is it for me to be able to jump to my conclusions about uh, the entire population of Alberta from just like that random group of people that I happen to encounter on the streets in the city of Calgary. Um, you can think about that for a second, uh, but I will also draw uh, the other half of this distinction here or make it explicit uh, and say that a statistic is a number describing a characteristic of a sample. So if I calculated the percentage of like my group of people in Calgary who said they had been vaccinated and you know let's say I asked 20 people and like 12 of them say yeah I've been vaccinated 12 out of 20 is 60 percent that number would be a statistic describing that sample rather than the parameter like we, which we know or think at least we know from the uh, numbers given us by the government of Alberta saying that well 75 percent of like eligible people in Alberta have been vaccinated against the disease um, this is something in it's a rare case that we know this particular number describing the entire population. In most cases, we're just kind of guessing about that. And in particular, if you think about that um, in terms of like linguistics research, uh, you're generally never going to have access to an entire population of like a language speakers. Um, like you're not ever going to be able to study like all the like speakers of English in the world or even all the native speakers of English in the world or all the um, Canadian English speakers in the world, just uh, there's too many, uh, and we have too few resources in linguistics to be able to do that sort of thing, right? Uh, that being said, there are um, some interesting uh, and I guess uh, not all that common um, circumstances in which you might be able to describe all the speakers of language, and that happens uh, mostly in cases of endangered languages, right? Where there's just a handful of speakers left. Uh, so uh, that actually happened. Um, in our program, not too long ago, we had an MA student, Kelly Killian, who uh, was from South Africa, and she had found a language in South Africa, a Khoisan language, which um, was spoken, uh, as far as she could tell, only by three people left in the world. Uh, and they were all siblings, and they kind of spoke it to one another uh, still to this day. So she found them and uh, tried to record as much um, you know, data or information about their language as she possibly could. So, uh, I mean, that's one way to think about it, too. Uh, that, like. In the known world, there are three speakers of that language. Um, they wound up naming it Tumi. Um, so there are three speakers of Tumi that we know about so that they form like the population of that language, basically. Uh, you could think about it maybe in a broader sense, um, such that there, that was a language which used to be spoken by more people uh, who presumably are all gone now. So in a sense, that might form like a sample of the entire population of people who have ever spoken to me in the history of the world. Um, but since they're the only ones we know who still exist, they're the population now. Um, but normally, if you want to study a population of or study some language, you want to be able to draw conclusions about the entire language, right? You want to be able to say something definitive about like English or French or Afrikaans or whatever, right? Uh, but you can't study all the speakers of that language. Instead, you study a sample, a subset of that population. And from this sample, you try to draw conclusions about the entire population. Uh, and in, you know, the research, research setting in which we normally operate, we're basically, you know, usually only get to talk, interact with, say, a few speakers of a language or um, a small subset of like data that we get um, representing a much larger whole. Okay, so again, what I want to focus on for the next few slides is like the sample design, how we approach the sampling process, how that can affect this desire we have to jump to conclusions or reach, draw conclusions about the entire population of interest. Um, so there's one way we can do this, which I kind of just described, um, which is called convenience sampling. So in convenience sampling, you just ask whoever is around. Um, and an example given here is a man on the street survey. Uh, this comes with a picture, which actually looks like it might be a woman on the street survey, but either way, it's the same idea. Uh, you just go out like in the city of Calgary and ask people as they're walking around, like, you know, what do you think about this? Uh, or have you been vaccinated against the disease? Um, and you're doing that and just 
letting kind of participants in your poll just kind of come to you uh, because it's convenient to do that. You don't have to say move around and find them. They just like are walking around and you ask them. Um, and this is problematic uh, because it entirely depends on the sort of location and the setting in which you're doing this sort of sampling. Uh, so like I said, I got these uh, notes from uh, a widely published textbook in the US uh, and they use American examples which uh, might not be immediately comprehensible to somebody in a Canadian situation, but they say like, well, let's ask about gun control or legalizing marijuana on the street in Berkeley or compare that to some small town in Idaho and you'd probably get totally different answers. Yeah, no kidding. So in case you don't know, uh, Berkeley uh, is the, um, the home of the University of California um, in the Bay Area in um, California uh, and is kind of... Uh, widely you know regarded as sort of the most liberal or progressive uh city in america um yeah so and then in a place like idaho you'd probably get a lot more conservative sort of respondents using this sort of method so you're probably going to get wide, widely different sort of responses to a question like um you know asking about gun control or marijuana uh but um to sort of translate that to more of a canadian context i don't really no, I can't really think of any sort of location in uh, Canada, which kind of compares to how a place like Berkeley operates in the U.S. But uh, you might think about, say, asking people on the street uh, about climate change, say, in like downtown Vancouver versus um, like Fort McMurray up in the oil sands in northern Alberta. You're probably going to get totally different opinions from a totally different group of people. Right. Uh, so you're responses will be biased sort of by the sampling process itself um, in this case. Um, so you can't just take your responses at face value in those circumstances. You have to acknowledge that the sampling itself might have had an effect on them. So this slide points out that bias is the real issue here. The opinions are limited to the individuals present, which may not reflect the individual, the relevant individuals of the population in its entirety. Um, yeah, so I will point out with this in mind um, that uh, people have noticed this about social, social, ah, social science research in general, um, that the participants used for these um, the experiments that we run in social sciences uh, tend to be, well, convenient because they're nearby uh, and um, also have a series of properties which some people have tried to label uh, as being weird. Uh, so what does this stand for? It means that they're Western educated subjects from industrialized, rich, and democratic countries. Um, yeah, so, you know, places like Canada or the US, that sort of thing, right? So, I mean, it turns out this is not entirely arbitrary. Like if you are living in one of these societies, you probably have more wherewithal at your disposal to be doing things like running social science experiments in the first place. Um, so there's kind of a catch 22 there, but be that as it may, the problem is that you can't necessarily assume that the way people operate in Canada or the US applies to everybody like around the entire world, right? Maybe, you know, it winds up being, they would wind up being similar to other subjects who come from other similar societies that are weird like this, um, but not everybody in the entire world. So um, the general point is to use caution when generalizing from your experimental results to the population of the entire world. And I've got a link here, which is also posted on the, the course website. And in fact, I um, will, uh, show you the link here like if you go on the course website to this randomness link and open that up um, it gives you uh, a handful of links i found over the years uh, that kind of help sort of enrich your understanding of statistics some of these unfortunately are are dead by now um, there was this uh this site called statistics hell which i thought was pretty hilarious but um is it's you know a way to help you learn statistics but it's not uh, a hell themed state anymore because it, that was basically a joke about you know some people don't enjoy this class uh more relevantly this is the um the uh, link about people in uh social science research in america being weird um and it says yeah we aren't the world very clever everybody's clever right uh so yeah and it gives you examples like this like um you know which line looks longer and like if you're 
an American like me, you tend to say like this one, or at least you perceive it as such, even though like intellectually we can know that um, like these are the same length lines. Uh, it's just like these arrows at the top and bottom that kind of confuse us. Uh, and there are cultures in the world though there where people have no problem like uh, seeing that the lines in the middle are the exact same length. Um, so what seems like fairly fundamental to us is not necessarily the case for everybody around the world. So you have to be careful about drawing those conclusions. And I guess the other example I'll use there is um, just the way we operate as well in uh, linguistics uh, at the University of Calgary and a lot of other places too. We uh, have a subject pool set up um, using students from our intro classes. Uh, they can sign up for a study and participate for extra credit. Uh, and to a certain extent, that's a form of convenience sampling because these are students who are convenient to use uh, for our studies because they're interested in it and they get some benefits from it as well. Uh, and we don't have to go out and do something more difficult, which is to study like everybody um, who might be relevant to the study uh, around the world. We tend to focus on like college age students who are around the age of 20, um, normally speaking, uh, and who are interested in the subject to begin with. Um, so we're not necessarily getting a totally representative uh, view of the world from this just this group of people. Um, and I guess I would say in most cases, um, you can kind of write that off a little bit. Uh, we don't know, since we actually focus mostly on such subjects, we don't know exactly how they might differ from like people, you know, who are middle-aged or elderly or whatever. Um, but normally you'd, you wouldn't expect a priori that they'd be different if they're like just like listening to sounds in English or giving you grammatical judgments or what have you. Or, or what have you. And if you really did worry about that, you could sort of test it explicitly. Um, but that does not mean that it's totally justified to draw conclusions from just these students in our intro classes to like everybody in the world, right? So just keep that in mind as you're running your experiments or whatever data you're collecting uh, when you do your own research in linguistics. There's another part to that as well, um, and that that represents a bit of what is called voluntary response sampling. Um, so in voluntary response sampling, the individuals will choose to be involved. Uh, so this is problematic because you can get bias here because different people are motivated to respond or not. And in the example I just gave you about our uh, part research participation pool in intro linguistics, those students are choosing to participate in those studies, right? Uh, there's a lot of students every year who do not choose to participate, but you know they're also part of the population of interest. We just don't get a chance to study them because we can't compel them to come into the lab to do our experiments. Um, the example that is used here uh, in a similar way is um, looking at public opinion polls. Um, and I'll show you kind of a couple of examples I've gotten from the slides for this. But so back in the day, in the 80s, there were um, a couple of advice columnists who would write regularly for newspaper readers. Uh, and I haven't seen them for a very long time. I used to read the newspaper uh, consistently when I was a kid in the 80s. Uh, I wouldn't read these columns, but what the way it was structured is that one was called Ann Landers and then her twin sister was uh, Dear Abby. Uh, Abigail Van Buren, I believe, was her full name. Uh, it, I mean, just when I stop and think about it, it's just kind of an odd thing. But uh, what they would do is uh, both sisters would take uh, questions from readers of newspapers around the country and who are seeking advice uh, on various topics for their personal lives, and then they would give them advice and write it up. Uh, yeah, I mean, people still do similar things in the modern day, and maybe you know, Ann Landers and Dear Abby are still doing it um, wherever they might be. Uh, but one example they uh, came up with here is that uh, apparently 70% of parents out of 10,000 wrote in to Ann Landers to say that having kids was not worth it. If they had to do it over again, they wouldn't. Uh, but they you know, were motivated to say that because apparently they weren't having a great time being parents. Uh, and I guess somebody did a more scientific study uh, and found out that 91% of parents would have kids again. And what is more scientific about the more scientific study is that the parents were selected at random uh, rather than just waiting for those parents to write in to tell Ann Landers or Dear Abby what they thought. Um, so, uh, as is pointed out here on the slide, the sample design in the sort of voluntary response case can systematically favor a particular outcome. So if people are more motivated to sort of complain about things, 
it like in this case you're going to wind up getting a more negative sort of view of the overall population basically uh, and another example I can think about that for this um, within sort of our everyday university experience uh, is sort of student evaluations of instruction, which we do every year uh, as instructors at the university. We get some feedback from the students who have been in our class about how we did as instructors, what we could do better, what we did well, that sort of thing. Uh, and ideally, the way the university runs it is that every student in the class is supposed to fill out a response form talking about these various things. Uh, and then you get a good picture of like the overall uh, sort of experience that students had. Um, you can contrast that with uh, a website like ratemyprofessor.com uh, where people um, just sort of voluntarily let the world know their thoughts about a particular instructor for a particular class. And what you wind up getting in those circumstances are typically two types of responses, which are somebody had a really positive experience or somebody had a really negative experience. Um, and it can kind of skew your vision of how, you know, the class went overall for everybody because you're getting sort of these extreme uh, examples on either side. And the same is true, um, one would think, for, you know, like Google ratings for like, you know, restaurants or hotels or whatever, right? Uh, somebody has to be motivated to go like, you know, four out of five stars, right? Uh, so take that all with a grain of salt because there's bias inherent um, in the sort of uh, data collection method, right? Uh, another um, example which is given in these slides is um, from online surveys. Uh, so we got some old timey looking uh, web formatting here, which kind of takes me back to the good old days. But it's asking this question, is the expense of trying to rescue a dog aboard an abandoned ship near Hawaii justified? If you ask me, yes, save the dog. Who doesn't love dogs? Well, I guess some people. So 41% uh, of the people who like logged into the survey said no. Don't save the dog. I guess just let horrible things happen to it or something. Um, but you know, it this doesn't necessarily ref reflect the opinions of everybody in the world. Um, it's just the opinions of everybody who decided to do this survey. Um, so, 59% of people happen to say yes in this particular circumstance. And what's nice about this, um, I don't know if anybody on the internet is still this responsible. This uh, survey came from 2002, <coughs> but uh, at the bottom here it says. This quick vote is not scientific and reflects the opinions of only those internet users who have chosen to participate. Um, yeah, so it's being honest about, you know, don't draw too many conclusions from just this data alone. Uh, I wish the entire internet kind of had uh, that warning label on it, but what are you going to do? We live in a free society and people can say lots of things on the internet no matter how stupid or horrible. And I guess that applies to me too, but I'll try my best not to fit those characteristics. Instead, what we will try to do as responsible scientists is to um, implement what is called probability or random sampling. So in this um, sort of approach, what you do is that you randomly select individuals from your population so that no one group is overrepresented. Over overrepresented. Uh, sorry. Uh, what this will do is get rid of that bias, which is a problematic feature of those other sampling approaches, right? So there's no bias in randomness. It's just, you know, you can randomly generate a number using R or maybe Excel. And from those numbers, you can just pick somebody out of a group of people without any other criteria by which they are selected, right? Um, and that is going to give you the best picture of what the overall population looks like without you having to sample every single member of that population. Um, I'll give you an example of this. Um, well, here's um, further sort of details on this approach, but uh, what's called a simple random sample or an SRS is made of randomly selected individuals. And each individual in the population has the same probability of being in the sample. Uh, and what that means is that all possible samples of size n have the same chance of being drawn. Again, this gets rid of that bias of like you being more likely to study certain groups or individuals in the population over others. Um, yeah, so um, I'll give you two examples of this. The one example they mention here is um, you can say take the name of everybody in a population and put their names, uh, draw them, write them on a piece of paper and put that those pieces of paper in a hat and then draw out some sample of those pieces of paper to study those people for whatever reason. Uh, and this is kind of a funny example because um, 
as you might know, uh, I spend a fair amount of time outside of academia playing the sport of Ultimate Frisbee. Uh, and uh, in the olden days in Ultimate, uh, when we would, before the pandemic, when we get together more often, um, there's a tradition called a hat tournament. Uh, which, you know, like on a Saturday morning, just like, okay, anybody wants to play a hat tournament, just show up at this field. Uh, and then when you get there, you write your name on a piece of paper and put it in literally in a hat. Uh, and then you would draw names out of the hat at random uh, just to form teams. Um, and it's actually a really good way to sort of run the tournament because, you know, uh, there's like this social aspect of sports where some people think they're better than others or some people only want to play with their friends or some people don't want to play with people they don't like so on and so forth but with this randomness you would just you know randomly mix people up toss salad style uh and then you get a team out of that so you'd meet new people and you'd play with um people you might like or you might not like but overall you would generally get the same level of quality across teams which is kind of nice because you want what you ultimately want there is uh haha uh some fairly good competition just for fun right um, so that's sort of an example of random sampling. Um, I had another example, uh, which I thought of, um, maybe I'll close this down. It seems to be overheating my machine. Uh, but the dictionary uh, or the Atlas of North American English was this project, uh, that Bill Lebov and Charles Boberg and some colleagues worked on, uh, back in the nineties. Uh, and they came up with lots of cool data about how English is spoken in primarily in Canada and the U.S., right? Uh, and so um, I haven't looked at this uh, atlas for a long time, but I, I remember hearing descriptions of it. And uh, if I remember correctly, the process they used uh, to get this data was, it, yeah, something they could do in the 90s, which I don't think they could do uh, again. But back then, uh, people still consistently would normally put their... Uh, numbers and names in a phone book um, so you could look at the phone book for a city like say Detroit and you could just randomly pick names in the phone book call up that number and see if somebody would respond um, and that's what they did they uh, I can't remember all the different questions or how they got the exact speech data they wanted but um, you know they would call names in a phone book for a particular city uh, until they got two respondents from each city. So you can actually see here for Calgary, they got two responses here. This is plotting data um, for the vowel U. Is it um, sort of, if the blue ones are less than 1200 hertz, so that's a backed U, like U. Uh, and the orange ones are fronted U, like U, uh, which you get more in the American South. And then there's like a mixture of the yellow ones, I guess are somewhere in the middle. Um, but anyways, uh, they got two data points for each city, right? Uh, and this is, um, so I mean, this the ideal there was the randomness ideal, right? So they didn't want to bias uh, their selection mechanism based on um, anything they knew about the city in particular. They're just randomly grabbing names out of a phone book. Uh, there's still a bit of like the other two sampling problems in this method though, right? Because um, there's a bit of convenience there. Like there are more, even in the 90s, there are certain people who didn't have their names in the phone book, right? Uh, so they weren't able to get access to them. Um, and so there's a bit of convenience sampling there. And there's also, you know, uh, they weren't calling all the tiny little towns throughout like the entire countries of Canada and the US. They, it looks like they were just focusing mainly on the cities here. Um, and uh, there's also a bit of the voluntary response sampling here because uh, if somebody just calls you out of the blue, will you answer? Will you won't? Will you not answer? Uh, will you won't? Uh, yeah. So um, only the people who wanted to talk to them, you know, got their data into the um, project. I mean, it, in this particular case, it winds up being structured data. You can see that uh, something fairly consistent is going on here in terms of like the vowel ooh. Um, but um, part of why they might have been able to get a good picture of that is because they were trying to. Uh, sort of implement this principle of randomness in their uh, sampling methods. Um, I, and one of the reasons I remember this example is because uh, it's not all that common, unfortunately, in linguistics research. Um, it's kind of almost going the extra mile, even though it's something that I think any statistician will tell you is something you have to do in your research, uh, which is to sample at random uh, in order to get a good picture of the population that you're studying. Um, so try that if you can if you can find a way to make it happen. Uh, acknowledging, of course, that um, there's always gonna be some flaws with our research. Uh, so, you know, don't 
bang your head against the wall too much if you wind up doing something that's not perfect. Uh, we need to be a little bit forgiving to each other uh, as scientists. However, uh, I can give you one more um, terminological definition here before I sign off for this part of the lecture. Um, it, this is a slightly more complex form of random sampling called a stratified random sample. Uh, and unfortunately, this um, would be abbreviated SRS as well. But um, a stratified random sample is essentially a series of simple random samples performed on subgroups of a given population. And these subgroups are chosen to contain all the individuals with a certain characteristic. And it's this is something we actually do fairly often um, in linguistics research, right? So uh, the first example here um, would not necessarily be immediately relevant to all linguistics, but say like divide the population of University of Calgary students into males and females. Say if you wanted to study differences in their heights or differences in their F zeros, something like that. Um, you can easily think of like, well, I've got a group of males, like all the males at the U of C and then all the females at the U of C, those form populations, right? And then I want to, I want to, <coughs> sorry, sample at random from those two groups sort of independently, right? I want to throw all the male names into a hat grab a few at random for my sample. I want to throw all the female names at ran or and a hat and then sample at random from those female names. And that's my female sample, right? Or you could say more relevantly, think about dividing the population of Vancouver into not native and non-native English speakers and see how they differ from each other. But you would still want to be sampling randomly for each group or dividing the counties in America as either urban or rural based on you know population density. Uh, I guess this might be another cultural thing which wouldn't necessarily translate all that well to Canada. Uh, but just to explain, um, <clears throat> sorry. Like the US, uh, hopefully it's obvious from the name of the United States of America, uh, there's a country uh, and then the country is subdivided into states. Uh, and then those individual states are all subdivided into what are called counties. They're like the next level of government structure down. Um, I mean, there's a couple of counter examples of that, like in Louisiana, they're called parishes, but they're basically the same thing. Um, anyways, uh, Canada is divided into provinces and I guess territories too. Uh, and then um, I think officially the provinces in Canada are divided into counties as well, but I, I don't get any sense that anybody pays attention to like what the counties in Canada are doing. Um, so, but that's that's what that terminology means. I also, I actually, by the way, will say there's supposed to be a Senate in Canada too, as part of parliament, but I have no idea what the Senate in Canada does. And I haven't met anybody else who does either. So if you, you can explain that, feel free to do so in the comments, but we'll go back to the point here, um, which is stratified random sampling is a typical approach we take uh, when studying sort of multiple groups, I guess, or when we wanna make comparisons across groups. Um, in linguistics research. Um, and um, what happens here is, um, or one feature of this, which is nice, is that you don't need to have the exact same numbers across the two different groups. So for instance, if you're gonna look at males and females at the UFC, uh, you could take like 100 males and 150 females uh, and make comparisons that way. Uh, as long as you're sampling randomly for each of the individual groups, you're fine in doing that. Um, it could have implications for the statistical tests you run down the line if you don't have the exact same numbers matching up. There are some tests that want you to have matching numbers and others that don't care. Uh, but I'm getting a phone call here, so I might have to pause. But I think you get the general point. And in fact, I think that might be good enough for this lecture. So I'll do number three here in a minute, and I'll see you then. <laughs>